Azad Awaz is a monthly patrika that focuses on the marginalized sections of the society whose voices are often muted in the cacophony of flashy mainstream media discourse. When referring to marginalization, the magazine does not aim to restrict itself to traditional focus of social aggregates such as caste and race, but also aspires to include a discussion on class, gender identity, environmentalism, etc. This month's Patrika attempts to focus on the concept of environmental casteism as a roadblock to the achievement of environmental justice. The central idea that we propose to explore is to what extent and in what ways does the structural inequality of caste, caste-based occupations, and the livelihood affect the accessibility to environmental justice. The interview will focus on the Dalit critique of environmentalism in India. Today, we have Professor Mukul Sharma, who teaches environmental studies at Ashoka University. He has published 16 books and booklets in English and Hindi, the latest being Dalit or Prakriti, Jati or Bharatiya Paryavaran Andolan, and the Cast in Nature, Dalits and Indian Environmental Politics. He's currently working on his new book, Dalit Ecologies, Cast in Environmental Justice. His research interests lie in examining the relations between nature, culture, politics, policy, and power. We're honored to have you today with us, sir. Um, so, Thank sir, you. In, so in your article, uh, Brahmanical Activism as Eco-Castism, you'd mentioned that Indian environmentalism is Brahmanical in nature and is so interestingly interlinked to Hinduism that it cannot be separated. Um, so, sir, what I wanted to ask is what do you think are the counter narratives to the dominant Hindu Brahmin current of environmentalism? For instance, you talk about Dalit environmental symbols as well. What kind of symbols are these and how do they challenge the existing assumptions about caste and environment? Uh, thank you, Ada, once again. And, and, and thank you, uh, Azad Awaz. Uh, on, on focusing uh, on such a, an important issue. Uh, so uh, you have uh, rightly said, uh, giving the reference of my earlier work, uh, that uh, the, the dominant narrative of Indian environmentalism uh, have been uh, showing a serious lack of understanding about caste and Dalit issues in India. Uh, consciously, unconsciously, overtly, covertly, uh, we have the dominance of Hindu Brahminical contents. Uh, now you are asking the narratives. So, uh, and if if I have to focus in the coming few minutes on 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 this kind of a counter narrative, uh, so. There are many ways emerged in the recent past uh, to build a new narrative uh, or counter narrative on environmentalism. Just take uh, one example of uh, Dalit folklores and its environmental meanings. Uh, we know that, uh, and people have worked, that Dalit folklores are an important part of Indian uh, folklore. Uh, tradition. Uh, they have existed since long, uh, often in a very complex kind of relationship with the dominant culture. Uh, the development of uh, Dalit cultural, uh, political, or public spheres in the recent past, since the past uh, two, three decades, uh, have really galvanized a dynamic Dalit system of organization of folk tales in their folklores or folk tales in their performances, uh, festivals, uh, protest, uh, leading to some sort of a diffusion of its contents and, and forms, and, and also making a very close connection uh, with everyday life of the community. So uh, the folktale uh, has also now uh, becoming an expression of uh, Dalit's environmental risk, environmental conflict, environmental rights, uh, and, and so on and so forth. It's uh, uh, many, many 
mythical characters uh, have been transformed uh, into symbols of uh, ecological ancestors uh, with immense physical, uh, natural, and spiritual skills uh, who have the courage to uh, liberate uh, the community, the Dalit community, from uh, oppressive ecological and social systems. Uh, for example, I found uh, in my field work um, that how uh, in the entire Indo-Gangetic plain of India and Nepal, uh, that, that uh, folk tales, stories, and songs uh, woven around the two uh, Mushar brothers, and Mushar is a very uh, uh, known Dalit um, uh, caste, uh, two Mushar brothers uh, called Dina and Bhadri uh, really thrive among the Dalits, uh, particularly uh, among the Mushar's community. Uh, Dalit uh, living in the uh, bordering sub-regions of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh states in India, and, and Nepali Tarai uh, have used uh, many voices and diverse sets of folk traditions and culture, oral tales, stories, songs, music, ballets, performances, proverbs, uh, theater, dance, festival, crafts, idols, uh, to celebrate their folk heroes, Dina and Bhadri. Uh, the folklore is uh, uh, frequently sung uh, in, in, in North Bihar and Uttar Pradesh uh, with many kind of performances, uh, as many as uh, 52 uh, wars of the heroes uh, that are being ways to uh, protect the poor laborers from exploitation by the rich landlords. Uh, the folk tale of Dina Bhadri uh, actually has helped uh, in transforming the rich cultural capital of Musars into their political, developmental, environmental capital uh, for the betterment of community as a whole. Uh, so this, uh, this legend of Dina Bhadri uh, has, has become effective for the uh, mobilization of marginal community like Musars uh, because of their anti, strong anti-feudal, uh, anti-bondage, and, and pro-farmer uh, uh, qualities. Uh, and, and this folklore uh, has also acquired uh, a dynamic ecological meaning. Uh, the motifs of Dina Bhadri are created, uh, as I mentioned, uh, created as ecological ancestors, uh, increasingly inspiring Muslims to mobilize and assert their environmental rights uh, and their agency uh, over the struggles on pond, uh, river water, uh, their fishing rights, uh, and, and many such issues, including also including land rights. Uh, so what I'm meaning here that uh, the folklore, uh, the cultural treasure, uh, the cultural symbols uh, that Dalit have since the past uh, many centuries uh, that have which which has been suppressed. Uh, that becomes a medium to build your counter narrative on dominant uh, against dominant environmentalism. Uh, so folklore or or uh, 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 folk symbols uh, are only one source to build your narrative. Uh, there can be many other uh, sources to build a counter narrative uh, on, on environmentalism, uh, for example, to give you another example, uh, that we have a, a rich uh, tradition of anti-caste thinkers uh, whose thinking and actions can be understood and analyzed from the uh, perspective of environment and environmental politics. Ambedkar, uh, Periyar, uh, Fule, uh, and many more like them, uh, can be uh, read, uh, analyzed, um, understood uh, from uh, environmental angles uh, to build uh, these kind of uh, counter narrative. I can go on, on, on and on. Um, but these are a few examples uh, which are uh, which which tell us that how uh, Dalits or any marginal community uh, can build uh, this kind of a counter narrative on on, on environment. Over to you, Adal. 
thank you sir um so sir the, another thing which um i read when i was doing my research on this topic was that um environmentalism movement has invoked a lot of hindu mythology in its discourse and it sometimes also valorizes or presents the traditional village as an ideal uh how does that impact or relate to the caste dynamics of of a space and do these ideas manifest differently in an urban space uh, uh, thanks for the for uh, asking about this uh, caste uh, dynamics of a space uh, we very well know um, and i i'm sure you all are aware uh, that the spaces uh, that 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 support uh everyday life making practices and living uh, the spaces of different physical dimensions uh, spaces uh, that are for uh, common or public use all all actually embody uh, caste and and symbolize uh, conflict ridden uh, past and present for dalits uh, so uh spaces of various kind in rural and urban india uh, they actually uh, they actually demonstrate uh, tension between uh, caste inequality and social integration um, uh, and simultaneously uh, the the various ideals of common spaces um, uh, that the ideals that they are supposed to be uh, collective uh, inclusive uh they they are supposed to be uh, supporting people's lives and livelihood uh, uh make them also an ideal site for uh, dalit's struggle uh, in their uh, quest for um, equitable distribution of uh, physical and social spaces uh, and, and 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 you're right here in pointing out uh, that space uh has an overarching influence on dalit lives and thinking uh, uh so much so uh, that it's being argued that uh, in the case of ambedkar uh, and even gandhi uh, actually a space uh, determined the emergence of their thoughts um, you you must have uh, seen the work of political theorist gopal guru uh, who who says that the uh, language of discrimination humiliation and 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 segregation in ambedkar actually was a uh, result of his location and space uh, a, a social ghetto uh, that was historically uh, produced and reproduced uh, according to him ambedkar had uh, no choice to uh, move out of the space and open up the new space uh, whereas gandhi uh, had a seamless space uh, quite hospitable and receptive and he could move in and out of any space uh, even he can go to the bhangi colony and come back uh, from the bhangi colony uh, he had the choice to uh, leave and create a, a new space uh, which uh, was uh, not there with um, ambedkar uh, so in 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 dalit discourses uh, uh, village uh, has been seen uh, experienced lived um, in their everyday life Uh, as an exclusive uh, caste space uh, most visible uh, uh, and most most prominent um, uh, and and we all know now that um, it, it, the the village um, uh, is structured by caste in many ways um, and and it determine the power relation uh, in many ways that is also uh, well recognized uh, in in the village caste st- space uh we know uh, dominant caste uh, occupy the uh, main power main resources uh, while dalits live in the periphery uh, and and remain in in distinct disadvantages in terms of access to and control over resources uh, and and resources of various kind uh, materials natural social political ideological uh, so the exclusive uh caste spaces uh in rural or urban india also often mean uh, exclusive control over uh, common spaces uh, 
be forest, be common land, uh, pond, street, parks, um, and many, many uh, uh, such such common spaces. Uh, you have talked about, you have asked about the urban space. Uh, in, in Dalit's imagination, um, environmental imagination, uh, in contrast to the uh, rural, uh, urban and city spaces uh, have symbolized uh, freedom from caste, uh, discrimination, and, and sites of entry uh, into the modern. The journey from the village to the city has often been considered by Dalits uh, as a leap into a, a new world space. Uh, if you read Nagraj, uh, another very prominent Dalit thinker, uh, according to him, uh, it's, it's something like um, a, a, an escape from uh, uh, persecution uh, and a journey towards a, a promised uh, land. Mm, however, we also know now there are good amount of res uh, research mm, other uh, to show that mm, uh, urban spaces have also developed uh, different kind of segregation, discrimination, um, and this did not prove as liberating as it was promised mm, in the beginning of urban development in our country. Uh, however, uh, I would add here uh, that urban space is certainly, certainly better um, uh, than rural space uh, in terms of uh, caste discrimination and atrocities. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, the urban space is also becoming a contested site. Uh, and you will find uh, various kind of initiative, struggles, movements uh, to actually make the urban space free uh, or to capture the urban space from the different vantage point of uh, uh, equality and inequality. Um, and, and what we have seen in the recent past, um, especially in the form of um, space uh, in rural and urban India, both uh, that Dalits and their various kind of organizations, social, political, cultural, uh, have taken up the uh, challenge to uh, restructure the uh, common rural or urban spaces uh, where uh, various kind of uh, spatial form uh, actually become an integral part of their uh, cultural assertion um, and their local tradition and contest against power structure. Uh, and and they, they engage with that common urban and rural space uh, individually, socially, politically um, uh, to, to structure that space uh, as per uh, their understanding of rights and their, their understanding of their own identities. Uh, uh, for example, take the uh, entire uh, issue of statues of Ambedkar. Uh, in the public common spaces or in Maharashtra, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, in many uh, um, uh, places of Tamil Nadu, uh, in small hamlets, village, small towns, at rural uh, crossroads, uh, on bus stands, on roadsides, on street corners, um, on government and panchayat land, uh, in front of schools and colleges, uh, they, are a, they are a case in point uh, that how uh, Dalits uh, in rural and urban India uh, are trying to restructure the politics of a space um, according to their own cultural understanding uh, and their identity. Uh, so space is uh, certainly a, 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 a new area of contest uh, and a struggle uh, in Dalit's environmental imagination, uh, the, 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 the aspiration uh, to universal, universalize the space um, uh, is a rallying point uh, for different kind of Dalit organizations uh, to um, put forward their environmental imagination uh, as a counter narrative or as their own environmental narrative. Over to you. So uh, I also wanted to know, sir, how does uh, eco the idea of eco-feminism and eco-socialism movement function in India uh, with respect to caste and uh, what are its criticisms? Um, are they caste blind? Are these movements caste blind? Look, this uh, is a very broad um, uh, question Ada, about eco-feminism, eco-socialism. Uh, 
uh, I think just just to to uh, uh, make the uh, answer slightly focused and clear, if I take the example of uh, uh, environmental justice, uh, which you can uh, call as a part of eco socialism movement. Uh, so uh, an environmental justice movement and discourse um, have been there with us. Uh, we know the discourse on uh, environmental justice uh, generated by American blacks and others uh, has not been able to uh, take note of the role of caste uh, in organizing uh, social and environmental relations. And the complex ways in which uh, Indian caste system uh, creates hierarchical power structure and, and, and works through uh, centers of power uh, to naturalize and organize environmental inequalities. Um, uh, we have seen environmental justice anchored in uh, race, blacks, in African uh, uh, environmental movement, uh, but we hardly find uh, uh, the place of caste um, in that discourse and discussion. Even the even the uh, the the so-called uh, new uh, uh, plural discourse of environmental justice, uh, which 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 offers uh, many ways to include the diversity, uh, difference, uh, recognition, and participation for. Um, unpacking histories and geographies of exclusion and discrimination uh, makes hardly any reference to uh, caste and Dalits. If you go through the wealth of literature uh, on environmental justice in India and abroad, uh, Dalits actually uh, have largely been uh, non-existent in the discourse of this so-called environmentalism of the poor. Um, even when the environmentalism of the, of the poor uh, have have uh, rich vocabularies and language um, of mm, regarding the rights of the uh, uh, subordinated, uh, but it doesn't um, address to the issue of uh, caste and Dalits. Uh, so uh, this this holds true for um, the entire discourse on environment in South Asia as well. Uh, so uh, through historical and 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 various kind of comparative perspective uh, which which uh, um, include gender um, it has been argued in the environmentalism of the poor uh, or or in the variety of environmentalism uh, which is being um, uh, propounded by people like um, ramchandra guha or uh, joanne martin um, they 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 try to address the issue of property, conflict, gender, uh, in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, conflict between uh, farmers and industry over forest produce, uh, conflict between rural and urban population over water and energy, or the struggles of poor against uh, corporates, market, and state uh, to retain their rights over natural resources. Uh, however, they uh, they treat a struggle for social justice uh, by various social groups uh, as discrete from uh, caste and Dalit issues. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, uh, very, very serious point about uh, 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 even the discourses on environmentalism of the poor or varieties of uh, environmentalism. So uh, the result is that uh, there, there has been um, a little understanding uh, that how caste intersects with uh, environment to create uh, socio-environmental inequalities uh, in India or South Asia, even within the environmentalism of the poor or varieties of environmentalism. Uh, and that's why uh, you asked about the eco-socialism. And in that context, I am giving an example of environmental justice. Um, there has emerged uh, something like a Dalit critique of environmental justice in India, uh, which has also specified the need to evolve uh, new perspective and priority areas uh, in various movement, uh, which should take into account uh, the issue of untouchability, low caste people, pollution, occupation, um, and, and, and very few research now have tried to 
uh, redefine environmental justice in South Asia uh, by including uh, caste and, 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 and discrimination into, it, into its uh, um, fold. So uh, on the other hand, um, regarding this uh, eco-socialism, um, what I have seen, uh, what, what we also noticed that uh, Dalit and Dalit politics also have not invested much intellectual and political energies uh, in developing a caste perspective of environmental justice uh, because of the uh, its caste blindness, uh, its universal language, um, its uh, so-called Western or uh, uh, hidden colonial agendas. So um, against all these uh, background and currents and cross current, uh, the question still remains uh, other that uh, if we perceive environmental justice uh, as a casteless pursuit, uh, like environmentalism of the poor, or like varieties of environmentalism, uh, then uh, then how it is relevant for uh, Dalit environmentalism? Uh, can a universal language of the poor, uh, um, an universal language of the poor and environmental justice, uh, which uh, largely exist in denial of caste, uh, articulate the resilience of uh, Dalits. So it's a very deeper, serious question that the, the concept of eco-socialism and eco-feminism, the way it has developed uh, internationally, uh, how much uh, uh, it is anchoring itself, how much it is localizing itself um, to include Cast and Dalit uh, uh, into their discourse uh, is a very big question mark. I have given you the example of some of the discourses um, and their serious uh, uh, blind spots. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so, sir, to end this interview, um, I wanted to talk about an article that uh, Yale Omvedh wrote, Why Dalits Dislike Environmentalists. Um, he wrote about how environmentalism movement was disliked by Dalits and Adivasis and how the upper level leadership of the movement was made up of upper caste people. Uh, it has been 20 years since that article was written. Um, so sir, in your opinion, has the movement or the view of Dalits and Adivasis changed over the years? And has there been any efforts on the part of the upper caste activists to change their strategies? Look, we are now uh, increasingly uh, seeing the critique, uh, biases of difference and dissent, uh, questioning the omission of caste and values in environmentalism uh, by diverse kind of uh, activist organizations, academicians. Uh, coming from Dalits or non-Dalits. Uh, you have rightly given a very good example of uh, Gay Lombard. Uh, I can add Kancha Ilahi, I can add many others uh, who have now written about this. Uh, there are voices of protest, uh, uh, questioning about uh, within the movement, outside the movement, academia, uh, in, 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 in social movements. Uh, I'm just giving you an example. I'm recently uh, working on caste and climate change and, and, and will be speaking on this topic on 25th uh, July evening. Uh, so I was interviewing and, and meeting uh, various people um, and, and, and got to know that um, at, the, at this UN conference on climate change at Copenhagen, that is in 2009, uh, that is called COP, uh, 15. Uh, Dalit women from Andhra Pradesh uh, 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 burned their uh, accreditation badges uh, in protest against the lack of uh, recognition of caste and Dalit in climate discussions. Um, in, in Copenhagen, uh, standing outside the conference center, um, they actually demanded to uh, bring in the voices of the small and the excluded. Uh, and, and they said that if you really want to uh, understand climate change, uh, then come and talk to uh, people like us. Uh, so, and, and during COP, um, uh, in, in COP uh, 
15, uh, they also spoke about untouchability, occupational hierarchy, um, the way it's still being practiced, uh, the landlessness, and how all these are very well connected with the issue of climate change and increasing climate uh, crisis. Uh, uh, if you see uh, some years back, actually, it was in, in 2014, um, I went to a uh, Dalit uh, Dignity March in Delhi uh, on 5th December, on the eve of Ambedkar's thing, on 5th December, uh, organized by the uh, National Confederation of uh, Dalit Organization, um, which is a network of Dalit groups in, in, in India, uh, displayed prominently the banner uh, demanding uh, Dalit climate justice. Uh, it was so prominent that uh, I, it is still the visual is in my mind. Um, and when, when I was interviewing the chairperson of um, that, that uh, NACADOR, uh, so um, he submitted a memorandum to the then prime minister um, uh, demanding, um, demanding not to compromise the interest of Dalit uh, in countries' commitment to cut uh, carbon emission and so on and so forth. There were many uh, demands. So while giving this example of uh, uh, Dalit women uh, burning their uh, badges uh, at COP um, uh, in Copenhagen, or Dalit demanding, uh, Dal Dalit organizations demanding Dalit climate justice, um, or submitting memorandum to the government, um, uh, what we are seeing that uh, Dalits and, and, and anti-caste writers um, are beginning to articulate uh, uh, their criticism uh, and trying to uh, address this issue of caste blindness, um, omission and commission uh, <coughs> in various um, of their understanding and action um, in, in a very uh, significant way. Uh, I would not say that uh, the situation is um, uh, entirely uh, corrected, uh, but at least there is more sensitivity uh, and real realization uh, to address the issue of caste and Dalit uh, in various uh, environmental discourses today, uh, not um, as a mainstream, uh, but many academicians are getting sensitive to include um, uh, in some or the other way uh, the issue of caste and Dalit. Uh, so uh, I would say if you, if you take the imagery of uh, a glass half full or half empty, uh, so it's um, glass uh, half full, but it's still a long way to go. Um, and, and you have asked about the leadership. Uh, it's very much needed that um, uh, Dalits uh, get their voice, uh, their visibility, and and voice and visibility doesn't mean only uh, uh, including them uh, in in organization or giving them uh, uh, some participation in decision making body. Of course, that is one co uh, core component, uh, but it's, but it also includes uh, revisiting radically the environmental discourse. Uh, your images, your language, your symbol, uh, uh, your perspective, uh, and how all uh, take note of uh, Dalit's aspirations, experiences, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, this thank has you. been a great interview, and it was really insightful. Um, so if you have any other words or comments that you would like to say, I would really like to...